order. Questions to the Prime Minister. Siobhan McDonough. The Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I know the whole House will want to join me in paying tribute to PC Andrew Harper, who was killed while on duty. His death and the serious injuries sustained by PC Stuart Outen in London and PC Gareth Phillips in Birmingham are a powerful reminder of the dangers that police officers face every day to keep us safe. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in the House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Siobhan McDonough. Mr Speaker, can I associate myself with the brave acts mentioned about the police officers? The former pri- Brexit, Mr Speaker. The former Prime Minister's deal was unacceptable to this House, but to leave without a deal is unthinkable. Yet the Prime Minister pursues a game of brinkmanship built on the livelihoods, health and future of my constituents and our country. But there is still an option to resolve this once and for all. If the Prime Minister really believes in no deal, let him put it to the people and ask our people if that is the price they want to pay. Yes, Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, as the Honourable Lady knows very well, this Government will take this country out of the European Union on October the 31st. There is only one thing that stands in our way. It is the surrender bill currently being proposed by the Leader uh, of the Opposition. And can I invite her to confirm, uh, can I invite the Leader of the Opposition to confirm when he stands up shortly, that if that surrender bill is passed, he will allow the people of this country to have their view on what he is proposing to have to to hand over in their name with an election on October the 15th, Mr Speaker. Robert Halfon. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, Can my right honourable friend confirm that when we leave the European Union on the 31st of October, no longer will we be subjected to EU rules on VAT in terms of our energy bills, costing Harlow constituents and households around £55 extra every year? Will he confirm that we will take back control of our energy bills and save households around one and a half billion a year on the heating and lighting? Minister. Uh, I, I thank my right honourable friend and, uh, for his excellent suggestion. As he knows, we do currently apply the reduced 5% uh, rate on domestic fuel and power, which is the lowest allowed under EU law. But of course, when we leave the European Union on October the 31st, it will be open to us to change this for the benefit of the people of Harlow. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I start by paying my deepest respects to PC Andrew Harper, who died in the line of duty. It's a reminder about the risk that he faced and police officers faced all the time, trying to protect communities. Our sympathies to his family, to his colleagues and his friends. I also, Mr Speaker, want to send our condolences to those people affected by Hurricane Dorian that hit the Bahamas at the weekend. I am hoping and I am sure that the Government and DFID will be doing all they can to make sure all help is is sent there that is necessary. Yesterday it was revealed, Mr Speaker, that the Prime Minister's negotiating strategy is to run down the clock and that the Attorney General told the Prime Minister his belief that the European Union would drop the backstop was a complete fantasy. (laughs) Are these reports accurate, or can the Prime Minister provide the detail of the proposals he's put forward to the EU? Prime Minister, I tell you what, uh, I tell you, Mr. Speaker, what our negotiating strategy is, and uh, it is to get a deal uh, by the summit on October the 17th, and to take this country out of the EU on October the 31st to get Brexit done. And what his surrender bill would do, it would wreck any chance of the talks, and we don't know what his strategy is at all, uh, were he to take over. He is asking for mobs of momentum activists to to paralyse the traffic in the name of of his... uh, What are they they supposed to chant, Mr Speaker? What what is the slogan? What do we want? What do we want? Dither and delay. When do we want it? We don't know. That's his policy. 
That's his policy. And can he confirm again, can he confirm now, that he will allow the people of this country to decide on what he is giving up in their name with a general election on October the 15th? Or is he frit? Jeremy Corbyn! Mr Speaker, my first question to the Prime Minister and no answer given. I asked what proposals have been put to the European Union. We asked yesterday, many colleagues asked, and the Prime Minister seems utterly incapable of answering. Any rational human being would assume, therefore, none have been put, and there is no answer to that question. The Prime Minister and his Cabinet colleagues have been saying he's making progress. The EU's chief negotiator, the Chancellor of Germany, the Taoiseach of Ireland say no proposals have yet been made by the UK. If the Prime Minister thinks he's made progress, will he publish those proposals that he's put forward to replace the backstop? Prime Minister! As the right honourable gentleman knows uh, very well, uh, you don't negotiate in public, and we are making, we are making substantial progress, and we will get that backstop out. Order, order, Prime Minister, please, please forgive me interrupting. There is a long way to go. There are a lot of questions to be reached. The questions must be heard, and the responses from the Prime Minister must and will be heard. The Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, let us be absolutely clear. This, this government is going to get a deal from our friends in Brussels. And we will, we will get the backstop out. We will get, a, we will get an agreement that I think this House can approve. The only thing that standing, is standing in our, in our way is the undermining of those negotiations by this surrender bill, which would lead to more dither and delay. We delayed in March, we delayed in April, and now we want to de- he wants to delay again for absolutely no purpose whatever. What does he intend by this? We are spending, in this government, we are spending a billion pounds to put 20,000 more police officers on the streets. He wants, he wants to spend, he wants to spend, he wants to spend a billion pounds a month net to keep us in the EU beyond October the 31st. And I will never allow that. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, I really fail to see how I can be accused of undermining negotiations because no negotiations are taking place. (laughs) He's been Prime Minister for six weeks and he promised to get Brexit sorted. In six weeks he's presented nothing to change the previous Prime Minister's deal, which he twice voted against. These negotiations that he talks about are a sham. All he's doing is running down the clock. At the weekend, the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster said food prices will go up under no deal. Will the Prime Minister publish Will the Prime Minister publish the Yellow Hammer documents so that people can see which food prices will go up and by how much? Uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster said absolutely no such thing. I can tell him, I can tell him, I can tell him the preparations, preparations for No Deal, thanks to his uh, good offices and thanks to his efforts, are very far advanced. But the, I tell you, the surest way of getting No Deal is to undermine this country's ability to negotiate, uh, which is what he is, which is what he is doing. And I have to say, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, that if this, if this deal, if this the bill is passed uh, this afternoon. I, I, said, I don't want an election. Uh, I don't think uh, he wants an election. Uh, but I, there's, a, there's, a, there's a petition on his own Labour. There's a petition on his own Labour website with 50, uh, on the Labour website with 57,000 people, including Carol, Nigel, Graham, and Phoebe, calling for an election. I don't know whether, whether there's a Jeremy on the list. But, Mr Speaker, I know he's worried about free trade deals with America, but there's only one chlorinated chicken that I can see in this House, and he's on that bench. Will he confirm again? Will he confirm? Will he confirm that he will let the people decide? Let the people decide on what he is doing to this country's negotiating position by having a general election on October the 15th. Jeremy Corbyn! Well, maybe 
maybe the Prime Minister could tell us what the negotiating position actually is. And I, since the question I asked, the Prime Minister may have forgotten it in his rather lengthy peroration there, <laughs> that the British Retail Consortium said, and I quote, that it was categorically untrue when the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster denied there would be shortages of fresh food. Mr Speaker, I hope no more young female staff are going to be frog-marched out of Downing Street. Because... There was another government leak at the weekend concerning, Mr. Speaker, there was another government leak at the weekend concerning disruption of our ports. The leaked documents written by the government in the last fortnight show no deal would lead to shortages on the shelves and of medical supplies in hospitals. People need to prepare. So can I ask the Prime Minister again? Will he publish in full the Yellowhammer documents so people can see which foodstuffs are not going to be available, which medicines are not going to be supplied, and what will happen to the shortages of vital supplies in every one of our hospitals all over this country? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I'm afraid that the Right Honourable Gentleman is, is guilty of the most shameless scaremongering. We have made ample... Ample preparations, ample preparations for uh, for coming out of the EU. Uh, what his what his party is recommending is yet order, order. It's order, order. It's very difficult to hear the responses from the Prime Minister. Members must calm themselves. There is a long way to go. The Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, what he is recommending is yet more, yet more dither. Yet more dither, yet more delay, yet more uncertainty for business. What we in this government want to do is deliver on the mandate of the people. Now, he used to be a Democrat. He used to believe in upholding the referendum result. Can he say now whether he would vote in favour of leave or remain? And can he say now whether he's in favour of a second referendum or not? Jeremy Corbyn. The Prime Minister failed to answer my questions about food supply, about medicine supplies and about the problems in hospitals. He refuses to publish the Yellowhammer documents and he talks about scaremongering. Where does the information come from other than his office in his government? And he's obviously so confident, so confident of the position he's adopted, he's now preparing to spend £100 million of our money on an advertising campaign in order to try to persuade people that everything's fine. He knows it's not, they know it's not, he is hiding the facts. The government has refused to publish its impact assessments on how a no-deal Brexit would affect poverty levels in this country. They received a request from the, under the Freedom of Information Act from the Glasgow-based Poverty Alliance. The DWP replied that the public interest would not be served by that disclosure. Will the Prime Minister publish that analysis? If he won't, what has he got to hide? Yeah. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, unlike, unlike uh, the right honourable member who would squander a billion pounds a month of taxpayers' money on staying pointlessly in the EU, this government is getting on with running a sound economy so that the poorest people in our, in our country are seeing increases in their wages for the first time in more than a decade. And I'm proud to say that those on the living wage, Mr Speaker, are now taking £4,500 more home every year than they were in 2010, thanks to this Conservative government. Speaker, you don't have to go very far from the portals of this House to see real destitution. People begging and sleeping on the streets. Child poverty is up since 2010. Pensioner poverty is up. In-work poverty is up. And he won't give us any of the information of the assessments of increased poverty that could come from his government's proposals. We are less than 60 days away from leaving the EU with no deal. The Prime Minister has had 
two days in office before the summer recess and then plan to prorogue Parliament. Yesterday he lost one vote, his first vote in Parliament, and he now wants to dissolve Parliament. He's desperate, absolutely desperate, to avoid scrutiny. In his third day in office, after five questions from me, we haven't had an answer to any of them. I can see why he's desperate to avoid scrutiny. He has no plan to get a new deal, no plan, no authority and no majority. If he, Mr Speaker. Order. If we have to go on longer because people sitting on the Treasury bench are yelling to try to disrupt, so be it, we'll go on longer. Some people used to believe in good behaviour. I believe in good behaviour on both sides of the House. It had better happen or it will take a whole lot longer. Very simple, very clear. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, thank you Mr Speaker. If the Prime Minister does to the country what he's done to his party in the past 24 hours. I think a lot of people have a great deal to fear from his incompetence, his vacillation and his refusal to publish known facts that are known to him about the effects of a no-deal Brexit. Mr. Prime Speaker, Minister. I, I really don't see how, with a straight face, the right honourable gentleman uh, can accuse anybody of being unwilling to stand up to scrutiny when he will not agree. He will not agree to submit his surrender bill to the verdict of the people in an election. He's, fr he's frightened. And, and Mr. Speaker, he, he makes a contrast. He makes a contrast between this government and his own proposals. The contrast could not be. The contrast could not be clearer. He thinks uh, we think that the friends of this country are to be found in Paris and in Berlin and in the White House and he thinks that they're in the Kremlin and in Tehran and in, and in, and, who knows, and in Caracas and I think he's Caracas uh, Mr Speaker he was. We are putting, we're putting 20,000 police on the street we're upgrading 20 we have 20 new hospital upgrades we are growing the economy. He, by contrast, would put a £300 billion tax on every company in the country. He wants a tax on homes, and he's calling incessantly for a general strike. The Shadow Education Secretary, the Shadow Education Secretary says that their economic policy is, and I quote Mr Speaker, by your leave, shit or bust. I say, I say it's both. I say it's both, Mr Speaker. What this, what this country needs, what this country needs is sensible, moderate, progressive, conservative government and to take this country out of the EU on October the 31st and that is what we are going to deliver. Order. Order. There will indeed be more, starting with the closed question, Dr Julian Lewis. Thank you, Mr Speaker. A well-behaved question eight on the National Security Advisor. <laughs> the Prime Minister. As my right honourable friend is aware, the decision to put the two roles together uh, was taken uh, by my predecessor, though I have a high admiration, uh, I may say, for the gentleman in question. Dr. Julian Lewis. Well, I hope my uh, right honourable friend isn't going to follow every policy by his predecessor. <laughs> this is one he shouldn't. The Defence Committee needs. <laughs> <laughs> the Defence Committee needs to take evidence from the National Security Advisor on the previous failure to anticipate the Iranian reaction to the British seizure of a tanker in the Gulf. It's hardly likely, however, that the Cabinet Secretary will come before the Defence Committee. So wouldn't it make sense as soon as possible to have a full-time occupant of the post of National Security Advisor so select committees and the NSC itself can do our jobs properly? 
Prime Minister! Uh, Mr Speaker, I think that the role has been very well performed in, in recent times. I take my, my right honourable friend's point very humbly and uh, sincerely, and I will make sure that uh, invitations to appear before his committee are considered in the usual way, and he gets all the satisfaction uh, that he desires. Ian Blackford! Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last night, Parliament once again defeated this shambolic Tory government. Today, Mr Speaker, we have seized back control from a Prime Minister who is behaving like a dictator more than a Democrat. The Prime Minister must be stopped. MPs must unite across this House to take no deal off the table tonight. Mr Speaker, we will defeat the Government again. So can the Prime Minister tell us, when we succeed, will he respect the democratic vote of this House, the democratic will of the people we represent, and finally act to remove the threat of a catastrophic no deal Brexit. Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I, I, can I, I might ask the right honourable gentleman if he will re respect the democratic will of the people of the United Kingdom as this House voted to do time and time and time again, and that is implement the result of the referendum. Ian Blackford. Mr. Speaker, I know he's a new boy, but can I suggest to him? We ask the questions, he's supposed to answer them. And, you know, quite simply, Mr Speaker, me and my colleagues, we are sent here by the people of Scotland. We have a majority. The people of Scotland voted to remain in the European Union. We're not going to be dragged out against our will by the Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister also mustn't be paying attention to the polls this morning which show that the SNP is polling to win a majority in Scotland once again, with the Tories in retreat. So if he wants an election, enable the bill and bring it on. Yeah. It's clear for all of us to see that the Prime Minister is playing a game of bluff and bluster. He doesn't care about stopping a no-deal Brexit. His strategy, as his lead adviser put it, is a sham. This isn't a parliament versus the people. It is a parliament standing up for the people. Mr Speaker, the people did not vote for a no-deal Brexit. This Prime Minister is robbing the people of power, handing control to the Leave campaign, a cult now running number 10. So once again I ask the Prime Minister, are you a dictator or are you a Democrat? Will the Prime Minister accept the legislation today? so that no deal can be avoided, and let us vote for an election so that the people can truly decide the next steps. Well, Mr Speaker, I'm a Democrat because I not only want to respect the will of the people in, in, the, in the respect of the referendum, but I also, I also want to have an election, or I'm also willing to have an election if the, if the right honourable gentleman opposite's terrible bill goes through. I tell you there's a reason, Mr Speaker, why, uh, why the... Um, these separatists, why the separatists in, in Scotland drone on and on about breaking up, about smashing the oldest and most successful uh, political union. In it. There's a reason why they go on about it, and that is to detract from their appalling domestic record. They are, they are a total shambles. Look at them. They have, they have the highest, they have the highest taxes anywhere in Europe. Uh, they have their educational standards falling, for which they are responsible. They are responsible for it. And their signature policy, uh, their signature policy, this is a useful one, their signature policy is to return after Brexit, to return Scotland uh, to the European Union, complete with the Euro and the full panoply of EU laws, and, as I never tire of saying, Mr Speaker, surrendering Scottish fish just when they've been taken back by this country. Lucy Allen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I warmly welcome the Prime Minister to his place? Yeah. Yeah. My constituents sent me here. 
to speak for them. And what they care about is better hospital care, more police on our streets, a good school for their children. Does the Prime Minister agree with the people in Telford that these are the issues we should be discussing in this place? And will he commit to building on his very welcome spending announcements to deliver great public services for my constituents in Telford? And I take the right. I thank the honourable lady very much. Of course, uh, we, uh, we love Telford, and Telford is going to see even more uh, when uh, the, uh, my friend, the Chancellor, my right friend, the Chancellor, announces uh, his spending review uh, very shortly. Uh, there will be investment in NHS, uh, in the NHS, in more police officers to keep our streets safe, to keep uh, the honourable lady's streets safe, and more money, more money for every school in this country, Mr. Speaker. Conservatives are delivering on the priorities of the British people. Nicholas Chapman. Mr. Speaker, uh, you know I'm not a doomster or a gloomster, uh, but on that positive note, I'd like to thank the Prime Minister for boosting support for Scottish independence. Into his premiership, maybe his last few weeks in premiership. Prime Minister, <laughs> according to the research published by the UK Trade Policy Observatory, a no deal Brexit would cost up to 1,100 jobs in my Dunfermline and West Fife constituency yeah. and over 63,000 jobs across Scotland. Can the Prime Minister explain <laughs> to me and my constituents who are facing this de- dreadful prospect? and uh, what their families should do in terms of the heavy price that they are paying for a Brexit they never voted for. Yeah, of course, of course, Mr Speaker, we are preparing for a no-deal Brexit if we absolutely must. I don't think that the consequences will be anything like as bad as the merchants of Project Fear have, have, said, have said. But the way to avoid a no-deal Brexit is to allow this government to get on and do a deal at the summit on October the 17th. And the choice for this country is who they want doing that deal, this government or that Labour Party led by Jeremy Corbyn. Yeah, you know, we don't name people in the chamber. People must observe the rules. No, no, or, order. 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 I am simply and politely informing the Prime Minister of the very long established procedure with which everybody, including the Prime Minister, must comply. That's the position. No doubt, no argument, no contradiction. End of the matter. Dame Cheryl Gillan. Mr. Speaker, um, can I welcome the new Prime Minister to the dispatch box? and tell him that this year we celebrate 10 years since this House passed the Autism Act. It is still the only disability-specific piece of legislation in the UK. The all-party parliamentary group, members from all sides of this House, are going to publish next week the 10-year annual review with recommendations for government right across the board. Will my right honourable friend undertake to look at these recommendations carefully and instruct his Chancellor to put more resources and more money into helping people with autism and their family receive the help and services they need. Prime Minister. I I want to thank my right honourable friend very much for everything that she has done for that cause over over many years and also to reassure her that very shortly uh, the Chancellor uh, of the Exchequer will be outlining not just more money for primary schools and secondary schools, but also a big investment in schools uh, for special educational needs and disabilities. And uh, that is, again, delivering on the priorities of the British people. Thank you, Ryan Davis. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, people in Swansea voted to leave the EU, but Leave voters are saying to me they didn't vote for a no deal. They didn't vote for do or die on 31st of October. They want to live. They voted for good things, for more money, for more jobs, more control, and now they see they're going to get less money, less jobs, less control. So they want the final say. So will he undertake, when he goes to extend Article 50 after the passage of this bill we're seeing this afternoon, will he ensure that there's a proper referendum, so there's a choice between a managed deal and, and, a di- and a remain and not kamikaze no deal? Prime Minister. Uh, well, I can, I can tell the uh, honourable gentleman that if he, if he wants to uh, put that matter to the people, then the best thing he can do is persuade his uh, right honourable friend in the front row to sum up his courage, to stop being so, so frit. And if he's going to pass this wretched surrender bill, then at least to submit it to the judgment of the people in the form of a general election. And, and uh, if, he's, if he wants to implement the will of the people 
of, of Swansea and what he should do is vote with this government and not with the surrender bill tonight. Mr David Gork. The Prime Minister has said that the prorogation of Parliament was nothing to do with Brexit. Is that still his position? Minister, as my right honourable friend knows full well, uh, there have been demands for prorogation of Parliament in the form of a Queen's speech uh, from uh, the right honourable lady there, uh, from across this House. This, this, this Parliament has lasted longer than any in the last 400 years, and on Brexit there will be ample opportunity. There will be ample opportunity to debate uh, the Brexit deal after October the 17th in this House if this Government is allowed to get on and deliver a deal. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Chancellor today announced another £2 billion on top of the £6.3 billion already allocated to help companies after a no-deal Brexit. Industry, the public and Parliament have a right to know which industries will benefit, for how long, and what the total cost will be to the taxpayer. Yeah. Can the Prime Minister tell us? Minister, yeah. well, I, 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 I can tell the, the Honourable Gentleman that there is a great deal of preparatory work going on, and particularly in the West Midlands, which he represents, to make sure that automotive supply chains are indeed uh, ready for a no-deal scenario. But we don't want a no-deal uh, scenario, uh, Mr Speaker, and the way to avoid it is not to vote for the absurd surrender bill that is before uh, the House today and let the Government get on, get on and negotiate a deal, because that is what we want to do. Mr Douglas Ross. Speaker, the Scotch whisky industry is hugely important in Murray, and the uh, potential tariffs applied by the US as part of their trade war with the EU could cost hundreds of thousands of jobs across Scotland and the United Kingdom. So, what representations has the Prime Minister made to President Trump on this matter, and will his government do everything possible to avoid these tariffs being applied to the Scotch whisky industry? Yeah. Yeah. Minister, uh, I, I congratulate my. Uh, honourable friend on everything that he does to represent that vital industry which indeed uh, earns billions of pounds in revenue for this country and I think that uh, tariffs on Scotch whisky would be absolutely absurd, a point that we have made repeatedly to our friends in the United States. But again, uh, when we do free trade deals around the world, Scotch whisky is one of those many products uh, that will have its chances boosted in export markets uh, where it is currently growing. Aaron Lee. Yeah. Mr Speaker, last weekend in Lincoln and right across the country there were cross-party pro protests against prorogation of Parliament. Does this unelected Prime Minister, who's got no majority in this House, believe that his attack on our democracy is his only means of forcing a disastrous no-deal Brexit on Lincoln and on the businesses and people of this country? Prime Minister! Well, if she wants to speak for the people of Lincoln, who after all voted to leave, uh, can, yes, yes they did, uh, I think the best thing she could do is, vote to, is make sure that we come out of the EU on October the 31st with a deal, and if she is genuinely uh, prepared to frustrate that ambition through the surrender deal being proposed today, then will she at least have a word with her friend on the front bench and urge him, since she speaks of democracy, urge him to submit his bill to the will of the people in the form of a general election on October the 15th? Will she at least, have, will she at least say that to him? Karen Bradley. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Many of us in this House will know the value of community hospitals in our constituencies, none more so than the Leek Morelands Hospital in my constituency. There has recently been a consultation on the provision of health care in North Staffordshire, and there is understandable concern about the future of Leek Morelands. So can I ask the Prime Minister to join my campaign to keep the Leek Morelands Hospital open in Leek with enhanced services for the benefit of all the people of Leek and the Staffordshire Morelands? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, firstly, Mr. Speaker, firstly, Mr Speaker, can I thank my right honourable friend for everything uh, that she has done for the people of Northern Ireland and thank her rightly for raising this issue in her constituency uh, with me. Uh, of course, she will understand that the decisions affecting Leek Morelands must be led by uh, clinicians, but I hope that a solution can be found that benefits everyone in my right honourable friend's constituency. Bromfield. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In a desperate attempt to win yesterday's vote, 
the Prime Minister apparently made emotional appeals to Conservative MPs that he was serious in seeking a deal. But his answers in the House yesterday and today make it clear there are no real negotiations, yeah. Yeah. in public yeah. or in private. Yeah. Those with whom he claims to be negotiating in the European Union have said nothing has been put on the table. Yeah. So does the Prime Minister understand why across this country people find it difficult to trust a word he says? Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, can I, can I tell the, the honourable gentleman that what I think the people of this country want to see is us come together to come out of the EU on October the 31st with a deal. We are making great progress with our friends and partners both in uh, Brussels and in Dublin and uh, even, in, even in Paris. But those talks are being currently undermined, I am afraid, by the absurd bill that is before the House today. I urge him to reject it, and if he must pass it, then can he have a word with his right honourable friend and ensure that that bill is put to the people in the form of a general election? Mr. Don't agree. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, in light of the uh, Prime Minister's answer to my right honourable friend, the member for South West Hertfordshire, could the Prime Minister please then explain why it's proved impossible to find any official or minister to prepare to state that the reasons for prorogation were to pave the way for a Queen's speech in the course of the current legal proceedings in which the government is involved? And would the Prime Minister like to reconsider the answer he's just given uh, to the House? Prime Minister. I, I, th I think, I, think I, I hesitate to uh, advise my uh, right honourable and learned friend about uh, legal proceedings, but I think if he, if he looks at what happened in uh, Scotland uh, this morning, he will discover that that, that case was thrown out. Ms. Karen Bach. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As a, result of, as a result of budget cuts to the Home Office and largely enacted while he was Mayor of London, police numbers plummeted. A thousand fewer officers in the West London Command Unit alone, one third police officers down in my borough of Westminster. He is now promis promising us to get us back to where we were in 2010 with an additional 20,000. And he has told us, he said again today, that those 20,000 will be frontline police and on the street. It is, however, now clear that at least 7,000 of those officers will not be frontline yeah. police. So, in order to help this House build some trust in any of the promises yeah. he makes, can he tell us if that is true? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I think it's absolutely bizarre that uh, a Labour member of, of Parliament for London uh, should ignore the role of the present Mayor of London, uh, who is frankly not a patch on the old guy, uh, who, who's, who, and I left him £600 million, by the way, I left him £600 million, and he squandered it on press officers, he Sadiq Khan has squandered it on press officers, and the faster we get rid of Sadiq Khan and get more police officers out on the street, the better, and that's, in my view, the best possible argument for Sean Bailey as Mayor of London. Yeah. Order. In the remaining minutes of this session, I appeal to colleagues to take account of the fact that we're visited by a distinguished group of Lebanese parliamentarians yeah. at the invitation of the Interparliamentary Union and the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Lebanon, chaired by the Right Honourable Gentleman Member for South Holland and the Deepings. We'd like to set them a good example. I'm not sure at the moment how impressed they'll be. Sir Gary Streeter. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I think I can comply with that. May I welcome the extra £14 billion recently announced for our schools, yeah, especially yeah. in South West Devon, where I understand we have to have the largest increase in the country to correct historic uh, under, underspending. Does my right honourable friend agree that this cash boost will help our hard-working teachers to prepare the next generation to reach their full potential? And won't it be wonderful once again, when we can get through Brexit, that we can start talking about education, health and social care, the things our constituents are really bothered about? <laughs> Well, that, oh, exactly right, Mr. Speaker. I thank my friend. Exa exactly why we need to, to uh, have this three-year investment in, uh, in education and get Brexit done, Mr. Speaker, on October the 31st. And don't be attracted to any more dither and delay and confusion uh, under the Labour Party. Vernon Coker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister yesterday booted out 21 MPs from his own party for voting against a reckless 
No Deal Brexit. These included very well respected members of this House, yeah. including a former Chancellor, yeah. including yeah. Churchill's uh, uh, grandson yeah. and the father of the House, presumably Chef. on the orders of his Chief of Staff. Given that the Prime Minister himself voted against the former Prime Minister's deal yeah. without losing the whip, yeah. does this not show and demonstrate to the British public his view of life? Namely, one rule for him and one rule for everyone else. Yeah. Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I'm not going to. I'm not going to take any lessons from the Labour Party. Order, order, order. Leave me to control the proceedings. I should be immensely grateful for your assistance in that regard. That heckling must cease and we will hear the reply. The Prime Minister. Uh, uh, Mr Speaker, I'm not going to take any lectures from anybody in the Labour Party about uh, how they run their party. No, 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 this is a party where MPs, good hard-working MPs, are daily hounded out uh, by, uh, by anti-Semitic anti -Semitic mobs. Uh, let, let's, let's, let's be absolutely clear. If the, if the right honourable gentleman is actually interested in democracy, if he's interested in democracy, then I hope, I hope he's been listening to what I've been saying today. In an anti-democratic way, uh, the bill before the House today would hand over this country's right to decide how long to remain in the EU, and it would hand it over to the EU itself. That's what that bill involves. If he thinks that's a good idea, then let him submit it, let him submit it to the judgment of the British people in an election. Richard Harrington. Mr. Speaker, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr. Speaker, I'm sure you will know that uh, tomorrow is the ninth annual Watford Jobs Fair. Now, I'm taking particular interest in the thousand or so vacancies this year. And I felt that other members of both sides of the House might be interested as well. I'd like to thank Victoria Lynch and Anna Cox for organising it. We've got a thousand vacancies in more than 60 companies. Um, Mr Speaker, I would like the Prime Minister, if he has any spare time tomorrow, because there's not much going on here, perhaps he could pop up to Watford where he'd be very welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Prime Minister! I, I, I thank my, my right honourable friend, who has been a wonderful champion for Watford and, uh, for, conserv and, for, conservative, and for conservative values. Uh, and I, and I, I, he's, he's also done a great deal to, and I've, be, I've been to campaign for him in, in Watford and I've seen how popular he is. Uh, may I say that there are, there are 20,000 uh, job vacancies now in the police uh, if he wishes uh, to take up uh, that role or if anybody in, that, uh, in Watford wishes to take up that role. And, and uh, there are many, many more in, uh, in nursing because, as he knows, in Watford and across this country, unemployment is at a record low and employment is at record highs because of the sound economic policies this government has followed. Thank you. McInnes. Thank you, Mr Speaker. This week, the Director General of the CBI wrote to all MPs in the North West urging us to do everything we can to get a deal that works for businesses in our region. The CBI says a no-deal Brexit would be disastrous for North West business, particularly small businesses. And we all know, we all know what the Prime Minister has said in the past about business. But now that he has assumed a position of some responsibility, will he stop this relentless posturing around no deal, listen to the CBI and work to protect our vital businesses? Yeah. Prime Minister. Again, a bit, a bit rich from a member of a party whose shadow chancellor says that business is the enemy. And he, she should listen. She should listen. She should listen. Where is he? Not there. She, where? He's gone. She should listen to the people of her constituency who voted to leave the EU and implement their wishes. And that is what this government is going to do. Sir Roger Gale. Mr Speaker, much has been made about provision for EU nationals resident in the United Kingdom post-Brexit. Much less comfort has been offered to those one and a half million United Kingdom nationals resident throughout the rest of the European Union. Is the Prime Minister in a position to confirm, not on a piecemeal but on a pan-European basis, that all pensions will be paid in full, that exportable benefits will continue to be paid in full, that health care will be covered in full, 
and that rights of domicile and freedom of movement will be protected. There are frightened people who need an answer. Prime Minister! Uh, I thank my right honourable friend and I can assure him that uh, that matter is, of course, at the top of our concerns with all our EU friends and partners. And we've made it absolutely clear, Mr. Speaker, that the very, very generous offer that this country has rightly made to the 3.4 million uh, EU citizens here in this country must be reciprocated uh, symmetrically and in full by our friends in the way that he has described. Stephen Morgan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister has said the great city of Portsmouth is too full of obesity and drug addiction. Despite this disgraceful, inaccurate statement about my home city, how would he expect our much-loved NHS to deal with these issues when it is his government who is exposing us to medicine and staff shortages, according to his own Health Secretary, by hurtling us towards a no-deal Brexit? Minister, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, I, actually, I must, I must correct uh, the uh, the honourable gentleman because, uh, in fact, uh, unemployment is well down in his constituency. Employment is up, and health outcomes health outcomes are, are up. And, and, and when, I, when I made those when I made those remarks, which was many many years ago, uh, it was it was I'm afraid uh, when when his constituency had the sad misfortune to have a Labour government in power. That is no longer the case. Ross Thompson. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Like me, I know that my right honourable friend has deep concerns about the unfair retrospective loan charge. It is tearing families apart, driving people to despair, and reportedly some to suicide. With over 8,000 people signing my petition, saying that we cannot go on like this, can my right honourable friend advise the House on what urgent action his government will be taking to address this? Uh, I, I thank Minister. my honourable friend because this is a, an issue that uh, my own constituents have raised with me, and I know that many of my honourable friends have had this issue raised with them. I'm sure that uh, members on all sides of, of the House have uh, met uh, people who have uh, taken out uh, loan charges in the expectation they could reduce their, their tax exposure. It is a very, very difficult uh, issue. Uh, a very, very difficult issue, and uh, what I have undertaken to do is to have a thoroughgoing review of the, of the matter. And, uh, of course, uh, I will make sure uh, that uh, my honourable friend has every opportunity uh, to have further discussions uh, with the Treasury about how to redress uh, the situation. But it's about the gravity. Singh Desi. Thank you very much. Mr Speaker, if I decide to wear a turban, or you decide to wear a cross, or he decides to wear a kippah or a skull cap, or she decides to wear a hijab or a burqa, does that mean that it is open season for right honourable members of this House to make derogatory and divisive remarks about our appearance? For those of us who from a young age have had to endure and face up to being called names such as Towelhead or Taliban or coming from Bongo Bongo land, we can appreciate full well the hurt and pain felt by already vulnerable Muslim women when they are described as looking like bank robbers and letterboxes. So, so rather than hide behind sham and whitewash investigations, when will the Prime Minister finally apologise for his derogatory and racist remarks? Which Racist remarks, Mr. Speaker, which have led to a spike in hate crime. And given the increasing prevalence of such incidents within his party, when will the Prime Minister finally order an inquiry into Islamophobia within the Conservative Party, something which he and his Chancellor promised on national television? Let's hear the answer. The Prime Minister. Um, Mr. Mr. Speaker. Order. Order. The response from the Prime Minister will be heard. The Prime Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Now, can, I, can, can I just say to the uh, honourable gentleman that if he took the trouble to read the article in question, he would see 
that it was a strong Liberal defence, as he uh, began his question by saying, of everybody's right to wear whatever they want in this country. And I speak as somebody who is not only proud to have uh, Muslim ancestors, but to be related to Sikhs uh, such, as, uh, such as himself. And I'm also proud, Mr Speaker, to say that under this government, we have the most diverse, the most diverse cabinet in the history of this country. And we, we truly reflect, we truly reflect modern Britain. We truly reflect modern Britain. And Mr Speaker, what we have yet to hear from anywhere in the Labour Party is any hint of apology for the virus of anti-Semitism that is now rampant, now rampant in their ranks. And I, I want to hear, I would like to hear that from the Honourable Member opposite. Margaret Jane. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The great lady who you and I both revere, I'm sure, Mr Speaker, once said, advisers advise, ministers decide. Can I ask the Prime Minister to bear that statement closely in mind in relation to his own chief adviser, Dominic Cummings? Now, Mr. Speaker. The reply must be heard. If the House were to want, as a matter of course, to allow clapping by decision of the House, so be it. But it should not otherwise become a regular practice. It should not otherwise become a regular practice. But we've heard the question pungently expressed. Let's hear the answer from the Prime Minister. Speaker, I'm used to breasting applause from Labour audiences, uh, particularly, particularly, since, particularly since, unlike the gentleman opposite, we are actually devoted to delivering on the mandate of those Labour constituencies, and we are going to take the UK out of the EU on October the 30th. And as, for, as for the excellent question that uh, my honourable friend asked, be in, be in no doubt, be in no doubt that we are deciding on a policy to take this country forward, not backwards, as he would do. Finally, Joe Swinson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I say to the Prime Minister that his response to the Honourable Member for Slough was appalling. Yes. An apology is what was required rather than some kind of justification that there is ever any acceptable context for the remarks such as he made in that column. He is the Prime Minister of our country. His words carry weight and he has to be more careful with what he says. My constituent, Kristen, is afraid because her mum, a European citizen, has been struggling to get settled status after 45 years in this country. Our friends, colleagues and neighbours deserve better than his failures and his carelessness with language. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, in the case of, in the case of his constituent, uh, Kristen, if she's, if she's, if, if, uh, 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 forgive me, if the case of her constituent, Kristen, if she's, if she has indeed been here for 45 years, and I'm sure she, she has, then she should, she should be uh, automatically eligible to settled status. So, so, so uh, clearly, Mr. Speaker, it is a difficult case. But the answer is for her to bring it uh, to the Home Secretary, and I'm sure we can sort it out. Order. 